Fellowship. My name is Pastor K. Kai. I am the youth and young adult pastor here at Living Word. And this is Zion. Zion, say hi. That's us, hello. But we just want to welcome you to this wonderful family. If you are new with us today, we have a wonderful gift in the first uh, time guest table in the north lobby just for you. So if you walk past it, don't worry. On your way out today, make sure you get that gift. Because the thing is that if you're new here, we want to let you know that you are now a part of this Living Word Fellowship family. So even if you're out of town, yes, just visit for a day, you will always be your family. So welcome to the family. Hey, Living Word family, why don't we just give a round of applause for all of our first time guests here this morning. And the best way for you to get plugged in, to connect, whether you're new or you've been here for five years and you're like, you know what, I've been sitting in the row for too long, I want to get connected, download our app. Because when you download the Living Word Fellowship app, both on the Android and Apple Store, we have a lot of things in there for you. Like sign up for a growth group. you got to get plugged into the growth group. Getting plugged into a growth group is one of the best things you can do because instead of just getting the message on Sunday, you get some fellowship on Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday. All right, so you have twice the blessing of God working when you sign up for a growth group. Go ahead and do that now by downloading our app. And on our app, we all have prayers that we need. And so there's a prayer praise report. So when God answers your prayers, because we know he does, we get to praise together. we got a wonderful prayer team that continues to pray and praise with you. So make sure you use that because we're always looking at it. Make sure we can pray for you. I can't wait for this little one to be able to pray. Guys, I know his prayers are going to be so powerful. Amen. Amen. And if you want to know anything going on here at Living Word Fellowship, text the word news to the number on the screen behind me. Text that word so you know when things like Family Sunday is coming up, when the child dedication is coming up, when we have baptisms, when the counter is coming up. Speaking of the counter, we have a counter right around the corner. Make sure you sign up for encounters. Trust me. To go through. Some of us, we sit, we hear a message, we're like, that's so awesome about who Jesus is. But you walk away going, I really don't know the full aspect of who Jesus is and what Jesus did. So when you sign up for an encounter, you're going to get a full revelation of who Jesus Christ is for you and for your life and what he did specifically for you. So make sure you sign up right now on our app that's coming up in August. The dates are the 18th. 16th, 17th, and 18th. Thank you so much, Pastor Tammy. If you have any questions, you guys should be seeing Pastor Tammy for that in the red room. And speaking of seeing Pastor Tammy, if you have any questions for RTC, RTC, if you're interested at all, you're like, you know what, I've been thinking about it and praying about it, I feel a tug, a call, and you're like, I haven't even got off their seat yet, but I feel that little elbow in my gut that's telling me, God's calling you to ministry. The reality is he's calling all of you guys into ministry. We're all become disciple makers. But if you want to be a disciple multiplier, that means the one that God's going, you're going to work in a ministry to be able to create disciples who create disciples. That means you are a disciple multiplier. Make sure you sign up right now on the app. It's going to start August 3rd. Orientation already passed last Sunday. That's all right. If you have any questions, you can grab a brochure and you can see Pastor Tammy after service in the red room. And speaking of making better disciples, if you ever wondered, waking up like, man, I love watching Netflix. I love watching YouTube. What if they just had like a Christian Netflix? If you were here with us back in December, we launched this thing for you guys. We paid for it for you, so you don't have to pay. It's called Right Now Media. It's a fantastic tool. I was looking at it more the other day, and I was looking at just how many content pages they have. There's over almost 9,000 pages, like 8,900 pages. And I believe it's like 25 videos a page. And each video has a study guide. Each video has a, a, a Bible study plan on it. Imagine, that's a lot of content. I think there's more videos than Netflix ever will have. That's so much Christian content that you can better disciple by just using Right Now Media. So scan that QR code. We also have some uh, stuff in the lobby. You probably got sent an email a while ago. So look at your email. If you type in the search bar right now, media will pop up an invitation from us for you to sign up and utilize that. It's a great tool for you to use. And the last thing is this, speaking about discipleship. See, if you guys know our vision, it's win the lost and make disciples. And so we're very crucial in trying to make better disciples. And so right after encounter, matter of fact, the 
this is a part of your encounter when you sign up. It's post-encounter. Because after you have the full revelation of who God is, you want to make sure that you're continuing to be a disciple about who God is in your life. And so you want to sign up right now in the post-encounter. Matter of fact, you have to sign up tomorrow because it's not on the app. But it'll be on the app first thing tomorrow morning at 9 a.m. So make sure you go 9 a.m. Look on the app. It'll be right there. And the same thing for School 1 and School 2. So if you've been through post-encounter, go to School 1. If you've been to School 1, go to School 2. Because it's going to tell you everything to help you to be a more complete disciples of this church and become a leader in this church. So no longer sitting on the bench in the sidelines. We want you to go out on the field, tackle some people, right? Pass a football that's coming around the corner, or throw some strikes and get some outs, okay? Okay? I'm like the assistant coach here going, hey, coach, I think they're about to maybe go for a good game right now. Maybe get the night game. So make sure you sign up for Post Encounter, School 1, and School 2. And right now, I want you guys to stand with me. I'll talk to you real quick. I want to stand with me because we're about to go into this song, and and, and when I think about this song, I, I thank God. We all have something to be thankful for. I mean, I have this precious joy in my arms that God has blessed me, my wife, with that I'm thankful for. And so I don't want you to just be singing karaoke, but I want you to pour your heart out in gratitude and thanks. What do you have to thank God for in your life? What is it that you've got to thank God for in your life? Because you all have something. You all have someone. I know deep down you are loving who God is in your life. And if you don't, don't worry. Then start thanking him and you will. You thank God, you'll see the blessings that he has for you in your life. So thank God this morning so you can see the blessings that he has poured out for you. The blessings you can be thankful for. Let's go, church. Let's get this.
just tap in because he's got you. He's got you. Whatever you're going through, whatever anxiety you may have, give it to him, guys, because he loves you that much. He loves you enough to change you, to transform you from the inside out. He doesn't want to leave you the way that you were, right? He wants to change you and make you more like him. He wants to give you peace. Peace that surpasses all understanding. Right here, this morning, lift up your hands to the Lord. Give it to him this morning. He hears every cry. Every cry, even if not here at church, even at home. When you're crying out to him, he hears you. He catches all of your tears. And he responds. He answers. And that's why I trust him. Because when I cry out, he hears, and I trust him because he keeps his promise. Lord, we thank you, we love you, and we give you everything, all that we are here this morning. We give you all the love. We love you, Lord. Aren't you guys glad that in the best times he's with you? In the tough times he's still with you? He's not just here with you in church. He's here when you leave. When you go out those doors, he's with you. So trust him. Walk with him. Lean on him. Not on your own understanding, but in him. Thank you, Lord. We love you. And we give you all thanks and praise here this morning. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord. I hear the Lord saying something. I was just sharing this with Pastor Mark and he said, you need to share this with the congregation. What I hear the Lord saying this morning is it's not just in the bad times. We tend to focus on that. Uh, that is just the way that we do. We tend to focus on, you know, we trust in God. We were, the first thing we think of is when you have to trust in God, there must be something bad going on that we need to trust him in. What I hear the Lord saying this morning is that he wants us to trust him in the good times. And on the picture that he showed me, I saw an eagle soaring in the wind, up above circumstances, up above the storms, up above all where things were good, where there was sunshine. Have you ever been on a plane and it was kind of stormy down below? And they take the plane up through the clouds and you get up there and you would never believe what's happening down below because it is nothing but blue skies and it's amazing up above. And I heard the Lord say this to me, that we need to understand that we are to trust him even when we are soaring. Even in the good times when we are soaring, we're to thank him because it is his breath that we are even soaring in. It's not us. Sometimes we think, yeah, but I'm doing good. I'm okay. I'm doing good. No, it's such, that's such a false sense of safety from the enemy. That's such a false sense of safety. So can we just praise him this morning? Can we just praise him this morning and say, I trust you, God, even in the good times. I trust you even when I'm soaring, Lord. I thank you, God. Raise your hands and let's just praise him this morning. Thank you, God. Raise your voices. Begin to thank him. Begin to thank him and saying, I trust you. I trust you. Can you say that with me this morning? I trust you. Come on, I want to hear you. I trust 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 you, God. I trust you even in the good times. I trust you when I am soaring because it is your breath that we soar upon this morning. It is your breath. It is nothing of our own doing that has taken us up above our circumstances. It is you. And we acknowledge you in, in all of your goodness. In all of your goodness, in all of your grace, in all of your mercy, in all of your loving kindness, 
We thank you and we trust you. We trust you. We trust you in the good, just like we trust you in the trouble. We trust you. Thank you. Thank you, Lord, that we don't have to walk this alone. Thank you that even when we're soaring, you have a hold of our hands. And that is why we can soar. That is why we can soar. Thank you, Father. Thank you, Father. Thank you, Father. I just want you all to remember that this morning, everybody. I want you to remember, when you soar, you're not soaring alone. You are not soaring alone. We trust Him. And yes, I've sought the Lord. And yes, that's why I know you can trust Him. In the good times and in the bad times, you can trust Him. Because I've sought the Lord and He has proven Himself time and time and time and time again. But He has proven Himself in the good times too. He has proven Himself. so caught up in what my wife was saying that uh, I forgot to turn my mic on. Hallelujah. God is so good. How many of you know you can trust Him? Man, oh man. I'm so thankful that He is my foundation. The Bible calls Him the cornerstone, the chief cornerstone, the foundation that we rest upon. I'm so glad that the foundation of our lives as believers is founded and rests on Him and not ourselves. Amen? Amen, amen, amen. Well, we want to take uh, the time this morning to receive the morning tithe and offering. I, uh, I want to invite you to participate and be a part of what the kingdom of God is doing and what God is doing here at LWF. Many of you serve in various capacities. Um, many of you are involved in different aspects of ministry. But I've got to tell you, there is nothing more important than your continued faithfulness in tithing and giving financing the kingdom of God and what God is doing here at LWF and beyond. Amen? We are so excited about the turn that God has made even in the region. I feel something down deep on the inside of me that God is about to do and it's happening all around us and I'm so excited about that. There was a real breakthrough back in uh, May and June, and, and just uh, just this 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 time when we got together and we prayed over the city when Pastor Jeff and Amy Franklin came and and God was shifting some things around, and I just keep feeling like that was a real turning point even for us here at LWF. And so we are expanding. I know it's summer, and I know people are on vacations. And like this morning, we probably got 50 people out right now on vacation. But we're here. Amen. And, uh, and next week, some of you may be on vacation and somebody else back. By the way, it's good to have Fide back. Hallelujah. She survived Mexico. Amen. Got back. No cartel got her. <laughs> Sorry. God is good. Hallelujah, hallelujah. Well, I want you to stand with me, and we're going to sow our seed this morning. If you're giving 
online. You can give various ways. You can give by your uh, your text. You can give on our app. You can give online. You can give by cash. You can give by check. What you can't do is an IOU. But you can sow your seed. We thank you so much for your faithfulness, your generosity. We were looking at it, and and uh, the electricity alone for Kids Crusade was fifteen hundred dollars just for electricity for that week, and it doesn't get paid automatically. How many of you know that? And it's because of your faithfulness and your giving and your generosity that we're able to take care of it. And by the way, that's with having solar every day. I mean, it was still that much. I can't imagine what it would have been if uh, if if we didn't have that. But but I just say that to say thank you, thank you for your faithfulness, your generosity, and your giving. In fact, let's take a look and see where we are. Did we get an update on our Unite funds? Hallelujah. There wasn't a tremendous amount, but every little bit helps. Amen. 215000 Amen. Amen, amen, amen. So if somebody wants to write a $35,000 check this morning, we will be done with Unite. But uh, in the meantime... Give the 20, give the 50, give the 100, give the 10, whatever you can do towards Unite so we can get this thing finished and, and making room for what God is about to do. You know, it's, it's amazing. Uh, we were talking this last week in staff meeting, and Pastor Kekai brought this up. He said, Pastor, where are we going to put people? I said, what do you mean? We've been down in attendance. He said, yeah, the sanctuary, but he said, we've got, we've got RMTC coming up, we've got uh, Encounter, then we have Post Encounter, School 1 and School 2, all at the same time, and we're practicing for praise and worship out in the South Lobby. The kids are practicing at the time of, of, uh, of, of School of Leaders in the, in the kids area. Where are we going to put everybody? And it just it just excited me in my heart. It didn't it didn't make me upset and go, what are we gonna do? What are we gonna do? That's the point, you guys, is that we gotta make room for the vision and what God is doing throughout. Amen. And so your giving into Unite is enabling us to do it, to finish this out, and we'll have another room back behind that we can utilize. And I started thinking about the back lot and saying maybe we need to move in uh, a double-wide uh, uh, classroom space or something in the interim time. Uh, guys, God is doing amazing things, amen? And you're helping us to make room for the vision through Unite, through your faithfulness, through your generosity and tithe and offering. And I just say thank you, thank you, thank you. Well, let's make our declarations this morning. Are you ready? Hallelujah. Is there any way we can take these back lights up here and tone them down a little bit? Is that possible? Never mind. There it is. Glory to Jesus. I can see. Oh. Somebody up there has got devils. All right. Are you ready? Say this with me. This is my seed. I sow it from a heart of love and faith. I joyfully release this seed with clean hands and a pure heart of obedience. It will do what you say it will do. It will produce what you say it will produce. It will become what you say it will become. This seed will further the kingdom when released into your hands. Because I'm a tither and a giver, the windows of heaven are open to me. And you're pouring out a blessing so great, there is not enough room to contain it. You will rebuke the devourer for my sake. He cannot destroy the fruit of my ground, and the nations of the world will call me blessed. With this seed, my finances are free from the spirit of mammon. I walk under the umbrella of your blessing. 
and I receive your blessing. Good measure, pressed down, shaken together, and overflowing in my household. I declare this in agreement with your word and receive it in Jesus' name. You believe that? Give the Lord a praise all around the building. Hallelujah. Remain standing with me. The ushers are going to serve you. I want you to turn your attention toward the screen. Even if you have a uh, Bible app or your Bible with you, we're going to join together and we're going to read this verse of Scripture as our keynote text. We've been talking about what if, what if, what if refers to what if we live in the Spirit and walk in the Spirit? What if we as believers are walking by the Spirit of God? What if? And we saw that through the book of Galatians chapter 5, the Apostle Paul tells us the what if. He said, if you're doing this, then this is the fruit of or this is what's going to come of it. If you're truly walking in the Spirit, a lot of people, they look at the walk in the Spirit as something that's, woo, you know, and, and shaking. It. And, and I listen, that's the move of the Spirit, and I understand that God can move you in the Holy Ghost. Amen? And I love the feelings and the emotions and the, and the overwhelming sense of the manifest presence of God. But there is an abiding presence of God that when we in our downtime, in our normal time, are walking by the Spirit, and it's a choice in whether we walk in the Spirit or we walk in the flesh. But if we're walking in the Spirit, there is something, it's like a seed that's planted in our heart. And when we walk in the Spirit, the Holy Ghost moves up on the inside of us and produces a lifestyle. He produces supernatural stuff on the inside of us. And it's not about the gifts of the Spirit. It's about the harvest or the fruit, the, the, the reproductive thing of God that is produced in our lives and it begins to produce these things that are supernatural. And we talked about them. We talk about love. It's not the love that we all know. It's not the natural love. It's the agape God kind of love. All the fruit that we are about to read of, you must understand, it is of God. It is God produced. It is God's character. It is God's nature. It is who God is. And it is characteristic of what we as believers are supposed to walk in. He said, you are supposed to walk in another place in this fruit. You are supposed to walk. You were designed to walk in this. Hallelujah. So your life ought to be one big orchard. One big orchard of the fruit that is produced by Almighty God. Isn't that wonderful? Let's read this together. All right, here we go. First slide. There it is. But the fruit, say it with me, but the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Against such, there is no law. We're going to drill down today on the two that are highlighted, kindness and goodness. The Lord add his blessing to his word. You can be seated. All right, we can turn those lights back up in the back. Hallelujah, it's dark up in here. Amen. Amen. Amen, amen, amen. Hallelujah. The Lord is good. So I want to drill down on this today of these two words that are often looked at as kind of byproduct of the fruit of the Spirit. We always drill down, and we did, on love and joy and peace and long-suffering, which is patience. <laughs> and we, we killed a couple sacred cows in the midst of that, of how we're looking 
at some of those things and how religiosity has come in and, and caused us to believe something about these different fruit of the Spirit that's different than what the Word of God actually teaches us. And so today, uh, we're going to do no less. We're going to focus on kindness and goodness. Hallelujah. These two words, or these two fruit, if you will, or attributes are very closely related. That's why we're covering them together today. They're very closely related. In fact, they're so close in their relationship in these two words that some translations mix the two whenever they are translating in various places. Let me give you an example, and you can look up on the screen. Romans 2, 4, and 5 in the New King James says this, Or do you despise the riches of his, come on, the riches of his goodness, forbearance, and long-suffering, not knowing that it is the goodness of God that draws man or leads you to repentance. The goodness of God leads us to repentance. But then, if you look at it in the Amplified, in verse 4 and 5, it says it this way. Are you so blind as to trifle with and presume upon and despise and underestimate the wealth, I love that, the wealth of his kindness. Same text, different translation. One says goodness, the other says kindness. And there's a reason behind that. His kindness and forbearance and long-suffering patience. Are you unmindful or actually ignorant of the fact that God's kindness is intended to lead you to repent, or that is to change your mind and inner man to accept God's will. So again, we see this as kind of almost like a hybrid. We see goodness and kindness intermingled in the scripture in many different places, and they're intermingled and intertranslated because goodness and kindness are a hybrid of the two. They are separate, and we're going to separate and show you the difference, but we're also going to show you the hybrid of it. You know, I love fruit, and we live here in the valley, and uh, my wife, she loves apricots. Anybody love apricots? All right, Tammy, catch. Who else loves apricots? Mary, catch. Well, there you go. Who else? Oh, there's a man over there. He loves apricots, and he can't catch. There's one right on the front row. One-handed. Glory to God. Sign him up. Apricots. Sorry, I didn't make it to the back row. And then I love plums. Apricots, plums. Ooh, I got a lot of these. I'm not giving them all because I love them. I'm the, there's one I already had termites in. No, I, I, I took a bite of that one. I'm only going to, huh? I'll buy you. She said, why'd you give all my apricots away? Who loves plums? Anybody like plums? There you go, Stan Reed. Yeah, one hand. Glory to God. Who else likes plums? There you go, right over there. Good catch. I'll give one more away because I got a whole bunch. Who else? All the way in the back row. Can I get there? Yeah. Underhanded. Glory to God. So, apricots and plums. But there is a hybrid fruit that is my favorite. And it used to be pluots. You ever heard of pluots? Pluots are a hybrid 
and they are, give me a little education here, 75% plum and 25% apricot. Pluot. So you get the best of both. And pluots are wonderful. They're 75%, glory to God, they're 75% plum and 25% apricot. But I discovered this last week, there's another hybrid. And it's not pluots, 75-25, it's plumcots. I never heard of a plumcot. We go into Trader Joe's the other day. And I was looking for pluots for this. And I looked down, they didn't have pluots. They had plumcots. Plumcots are a 50-50 hybrid. They're more of a taste of an apricot than the pluot is. Did anybody learn anything today? Useless information. Maybe not. Because I want to draw your attention. Plumcots are amazing. I tasted that, and I said, man, if I can't find a pluot, I'm going to find me a plum cot, right? And then I found out they have different seasons. They're short on the season, and that's why uh, in various times you can find pluots, and other times you can find plum cots. So there you go. That was free, didn't cost you anything, nothing extra in the offering for that. But I'm going to set out this morning plum cots. And I'm going to put them here. And no, Q, I'm sorry, I'm not giving them away because I love them. Q asked me, he said, Pastor, if you're giving away fruit, I want some. Where's, where's Q at? Q, I'll give you a plum. There you go, buddy. All right. He said earlier, he said, I'm going to bring that extra table up. If you're giving away fruit, I want it. Hallelujah. All right. So, we have plum cots. And what a plum cot is, is the hybrid half plum and half apricot. I want to talk to you this morning about the difference and the hybrid, if you will, of kindness and goodness. These two are different fruit, but combined together, it's almost like God is giving us a hybrid, a hybrid fruit that is the mixture of the two. And he joins them together. They are so interrelated that scripturally, oftentimes scholars confuse the two. Is it a plum? Is it an apricot? I don't know. Some of them think it's this, some of them think it's that, and so we get the hybrid of it. Do you follow me? And so we're going to drill down on this because the scripture is very, very clear and wants us to have good understanding, and the reason for it is simply this, and I think we, we miss this so many times when we're looking at the fruit of the Spirit. The Bible says... In the book of Psalms, chapter 34, verse 8, O taste and see that the Lord is what? Good. Goodness. Taste and see that the Lord is good. David says this in the book of Psalms, chapter 34, verse number 8, O taste and see that the Lord is good. How blessed is the man who takes refuge in him. David is basically evangelizing all the way back in the book of Psalms when he writes this. He says, you got to taste this. Can I make a Baptist talk in tongues? That is so good. So wonderful. So tasty. Juicy. It's it's hard to describe it. Mm. Y'all just oh. Mm. oh. 
That's what David was doing. He was saying, take a bite out of my life and see how good God is. All you got to do is look at my life and I draw your attention to what God, and he can spit and blow, to what God has done in my life and you can taste of it too. Because the same God that did it for me will do it for you. And I'm saying, look at my life and taste and see. God is good. And he said, and the man who follows him will be blessed. You know what David is doing? David is evangelizing. David is sharing. He said, everybody ought to taste of this. I perceive God as no respecter of persons. Do you get this? In fact, I love this because the word kindness, it actually means to be adaptable to the needs of others. A lot of people, they look at kindness and they think, oh, they're nice. They're kind. They're kind of hearted. I, I don't know anybody nicer than Nathan Caldera. He just oozes niceness. He oozes. You walk up to him and you just you just feel this nice guy. I mean, what a great guy, right? He's kind. He's so kind and gentle. And I look at that and I go, how in the world can anybody just ooze that out of him? I look at him and I'm I walk around, and everybody looks at me and goes, oh, glory to God, you know, and it's, it's like intense, you know, and my face shows it and everything. He's always smiling and kind and gentle and wonderful, and I think, oh, but see, I'm not talking about a personality trait. When we talk about kindness, it is a God trait that he is describing and the word kindness actually means and refers to being adaptable to the needs of others. <clears throat> I love this. It is the ability to empathize with other people, to feel compassion for them and put their needs above your own. That's the true meaning of kindness. So when he says, this is a fruit of the Spirit, he's saying the fruit of the Spirit is to be able to be adaptable wherever you go to the needs of others. The ability to empathize with other people, to feel compassion for them, and to put their needs above your own. It's interesting because the Bible says that the Spirit of God rested upon Jesus and he was often saw the crowds and the Bible says he was moved with compassion. That word compassion is really not a good translation. What it actually means is to empathize. To empathize. Jesus became flesh and blood, he walked around and he saw the poverty and he saw the hurt and the woundedness and he saw the oppression of the Roman government. He saw that people were struggling and he wasn't just nice about it. He wasn't just kind about it. He actually empathized with where we were. He was empathizing, watch this, with where we were before he took human form. Because the Bible says in the book of Ephesians chapter 2 that there was a, if you will, there was this, this, this meeting in heaven where God the Father said, we've got to reach them, and God the Son says, I volunteer. I volunteer. I am so moved with my love for them and my care for humanity that I'll go and clothe myself in filthy flesh. 
I give up the splendor of heaven and all that we are in order to be able to go to them because what good is where we're at without getting it into the hands and the hearts of the people that we created. I love mankind so much that I will clothe myself and go to them. You see, this is why Jesus was able to say to the disciples after he was dead, buried, resurrected, and gave the commission, and he said, Go, go, you've received me, now you have within you the same kindness that I have. So go, go, go. Like I went and clothed myself, like I went and empathized with man and was moved with compassion, for they were as sheep having no shepherd, and he calls himself, and we know him as the good shepherd. And so we need to understand that whenever God is coming to man and reaching humanity, he is adaptable to the needs of others. He is empathizing with humanity, and he is moved with compassion for them, and he put their needs above his own life. This is the picture of the kindness of God. But it goes further, and I'm reminded oftentimes, it's, it's really a, a very amazing fruit or trait or characteristic of the Spirit. Because our flesh, how many of you know, is just the opposite. Our flesh is contrary to that. This is the way I am. Take it or leave it. Like it or lump it. I'm not adapting to you and your needs. I'm not doing that. You take me the way I am. And we, and we are selfish in our human nature to make it about us. I, I, I'll never forget, I was in Tulsa and had a flat tire, and this is before the day of cell phones. Some of you younger folks, you can't remember those days. I remember them well. Shoot, I remember when we didn't even have a portable phone in the house. It was hung on a wall, and it, you could talk as far as it would stretch. The, my grandmother had a cord that was really long and came up and it stretched and you could walk into the living room in her house and be on the phone, but you were connected, right? You, you had to be connected with that. Wireless didn't exist back then. And uh, I don't know why. It's, oh, yeah, I'm in Tulsa and I have no phone and I've got a flat tire. I came out of a video arcade. Some of you have no idea what those are either. And I was in there and I was playing video games and I came out, and when I did, my car had a flat tire, and I was very upset. And the reason I was upset was because I couldn't call my wife, because I didn't want my wife to know I'd been in the arcade, putting quarters in Pac-Man and Mrs. Pac-Man and Donkey Kong was my favorite, right? And, right? I'm, I know I'm giving away my age. But, you know, when, when video games got too complex to push all these buttons and all these combinations, I just gave up and said, give me a joystick. That's easy. Frogger, right? And so, so I'm in this video arcade, and I'm playing games, and I come out, and I got a flat tire. I can't call my wife. And so I'm looking around at people, and I'm saying, can somebody help me with my flat tire? And everybody's looking at me like, are you crazy? And they just walk on. Nobody stops to help. And I'm like, you know, I'm, I'm over there and I'm lugging this and, and, and I'm getting the spare out of the back and I'm trying to think about how I'm going to explain this to Tammy. And uh, I'm going on and on and I can't pick up the phone and call a friend, phone a friend. I can't do that. There is no such thing. And I'm looking around, and, I'm, and I actually said, hey, can I get a little help? Because, you know, it's heavy and whatever, and, and everybody just 
some of them look down like, uh, I don't want to look at you because if I look at you, it's going to make me feel obligated and I don't want to do it. And there was no kindness, no kindness whatsoever. And, and I think about the kindness of God and I think about the fact that he pursued us and he was moved with compassion. He was adaptable to our needs. I I think scripturally there's no greater example of this than the Apostle Paul. In fact, you can look up on the screen in 1 Corinthians 9, 19 through 23, Paul gives us a perfect example of somebody showing forth the kindness of God and walking in the fruit of kindness. He said, even though I'm free, I'm a free man with no master, I have become a slave to all people in order to bring many to Christ. In order to bring many to Christ. When I was with the Jews, I lived like a Jew to bring the Jews to Christ. When I was with those that followed the Jewish law, I too lived under the law. Even though I'm not subject to the law any longer, I did this. Why? so I could bring them to Christ who are under the law. When I was with the Gentiles, when I'm with the Gentiles who don't follow the Jewish law, I too live apart from the law so that I can bring them to Christ. And then he almost parenthetically says, now I don't ignore the law of God. I obey the law of Christ get to that in a minute. And then he goes on and he says, when I'm weak, I am with, or when I am with those who are weak, I share in their weakness because I want to bring them to Christ. Yes, I try to find common ground with everyone, doing everything I can to save some. I do everything to spread the good news and share in its blessing. Basically, what Paul is saying to summarize is this. Wherever I'm at, I become like those. I become all things to all men, all the different cultures, all the different backgrounds, all the different mindsets. I become all things to all men for one reason. I want to win them to Christ. And this kindness is the picture of saying, I will adapt. I've never seen the body of Christ so rigid, so rigid and judgmental and hardcore. Can I just tell you, you're never going to win anybody to Christ if you walk around judging everybody for where they're at. Now, Paul said, I'll become all things to all men, but what I won't do is go out there and party with you because I am a Christian. So so this is not becoming a chameleon that whoever you're around, you start adopting their mindset and their lostness and disobeying the cause of Christ. But what he said was what David Wilkerson did whenever he walked in to the Mau Mau's in New York City. And he walked in and he saw Nikki Cruz and he, and, and he saw a guy that was hurting. And he said, don't you know, preacher, I could cut you up right here and right now? He said, yeah, Nikki, you could cut me up. And every piece that you cut up would be crying out, Jesus loves you and I love you, Nikki. He wasn't, it, what Paul was saying was this, I'm not afraid to go into the den of lions. I'm not afraid to understand the deeper issue here that they are the way they are because they're missing Christ. And so I'm going to go and I'm going to be a part of that and I'm going to go right into the midst of that and I'm going to adapt to what's going on around me. Do you see, whenever I came to uh, Living Word, when I, when I moved here in 1996, I was driving around and I was praying and I said, God, Give me the vision for this city. Tell me what it is that you want us to. You've called me here. Now what? And 
I was driving down L Street in my 1993 Ford Ranger pickup that I ended up giving to Josh later on when he became of age or older and was able to drive. But I was driving down the road, and I'm driving down, and God gives me this open vision. And he I said, Lord, what is this? And he said, I'm showing you how I see this city. And I saw these people that were dressed, these men dressed in three-piece suits, and these women with the big hats and, you know, the purse that they used to carry, and they're all proper like this, walking down the street. And I saw people on the street who were hurting and wounded. They were in hospital gowns, and their, their faces and their heads were oozing, and, and, and there was open sewage in the, in the gutters. And these little kids had sores of pain and filthy and crying and weeping. And they're walking down the streets, and here I am with this open vision. And these people that were walking past them, these, these ladies would walk right past the people who were hurting. And one little boy reached over and, and grabbed hold of one of the ladies' dresses, pulling at her skirt tail. And she pulls out a handkerchief and pushes him away and starts wiping the muck off of her beautiful skirt as she's walking by. I saw men in three-piece suits that would see someone that was hurting and in bandages and bleeding, and they would go to the other side of L Street and walk so they didn't have to encounter them. I said, Lord, what is this? And he said, I'm going to make you a hospital of grace and healing and restoration. And he said, I said, what are all these? And he said, they are the religious in this city that are doing nothing to reach those that are hurting and wounded, and they want to walk on by and maintain their image, and on and on and on. And I just say to you today, church, walking in the Spirit will cause us to develop the compassion and the empathy and the care and the concern and the kindness of God towards lost humanity. These two things, kindness and goodness, are the hybrid that it takes to win lost humanity to Christ. It is the part of the Great Commission. You see, when we talk about love, yes, it's all about winning other people. But you need to understand, walking in love impacts every single relationship. And, and, and joy and peace and long-suffering, it's all about how we endure tough times in order to live for Christ and not give up. And there's this stick to itness that is on the inside of us that, that, we're, that, that it's a fruit of the Spirit that gives us the tenacity to barrel through. But when we shift over to this fruit, every fruit has its own taste and its own purpose. And what God is saying is this, if you want to reach lost humanity, you better grow you some kindness. You better grow you some goodness. Because this is the attribute of my nature that wins lost humanity. I am here for the whole world, for God so loved the world. Watch this. He so loved the world that he gave. That he gave. And so this issue of Paul, when he says, I've become all things to all men, in hopes that I might win some, his focus was his love for lost humanity, and he said, it developed kindness in me. It developed in the walk of the Spirit this kindness, this ability to adapt to whatever culture, man, woman, gay, straight. Come on. Never going to reach people as long as you stand in judgment of their sin and their lostness. We must stop that in the body of Christ. This rigid mindset. I am not saying that you compromise who you are and what you believe. 
I'm not saying that, but I am saying you got to get the edge off and understand and empathize with where people are at and love them in the midst of their mess. And it's the kindness of God that will do that. Whether they're from the right side of the tracks or the wrong side of the tracks. Doesn't matter how they grew up. I was looking and watching, and this is not a political statement, but I didn't know who J.D. Vance was. And Trump picked him as his running mate, and so I'm looking a little bit to see who is this guy. And I and I started looking at his past and how he was raised and where he was. And I think to myself, but when we watched the movie, or I did, my wife said, oh, that language is horrible. But I endured the language because I wanted to find out who the man was and where he came from. And it was. It was terrible, horrible language. And I said to Tammy, this guy grew up in abuse, neglect, his own mother telling him, I hate you, I hate the day you were born, things like that. He was raised in this, an alcoholic and drug addict mother, a father who he never knew, and on and on and on. The, the throes of poverty where his grandmother is negotiating with Meals on Wheels to get more food to take care of him. And I, I, just, I just looked at that and my heart broke. How many others are right here in our back door, right here out in the field that are homeless? And all of a sudden, it started hitting me whenever I go out in the heat. And I, and I can't hardly breathe just going out to the car. Come on, somebody. Are you kidding me right now? 108, 111 gives a point for global warming. I don't know. All I know is I feel like I'm in Arizona in the desert, right, when I walk out there. And you know what my mind did? The other day we were up and we went into uh, Fresno and we watched a movie. That Tammy and I went and we had lunch. And we came out from lunch and it was blazing hot. And it just moving from, from, from the movie theater to walk across the place up at Edwards to go over to the Spicy James was so hot that you just almost passed out. And I looked at her and I said, imagine the homeless that have no reprieve. And I, I just, I just, my heart began to break. And I think about people that are hurting, wounded around us. Listen to me. It is the kindness of God that rises up in our heart to say, I care more about you as a human being than I do that you come from this background or that background or you live in this lifestyle or that. See, I believe Jesus is the answer for everybody. I said, I believe he's the answer for everybody. And, and, and so, I don't care if you're here in America legally or illegally. You're here. You're a human being. And I have compassion even for the man that was trying to kill former President Trump. Compassion for that young man that's up there. You see, the reason is because it was the Apostle Paul whenever he was consenting to Stephen's death. And Stephen said, I have compassion for that man up there. And it was that expression of the compassion. Father, forgive them. They don't know what they're doing. And it was that release of compassion and kindness towards Saul of Tarsus that enabled him to have an encounter with Jesus and transform his life. And I say, we've got to love people no matter where they're at. And the kindness of God, I'm not saying endorse their lifestyle. Paul said, I'm not becoming what they're becoming. 
but I am going among them and saying, I'm not better than you. I just kept Christ in my life, and he'll turn my life. He turned my life around. I was a murderer. I was horrible. Paul talks about this in his writings. He said, I don't know how God could ever forgive me for the things I did. But I am a man that is so forgiven and understanding that I was once there. Come on, somebody. That it it compels me. It motivates me. It's the kindness of God that pushes me into hurting humanity and says, I'll tolerate, I'll, I'll, I'll endure what they're going through, and I'll relate to it, because I believe I'm carrying the answer. And the only way to win them to Christ is to become one of them. I'm not saying become their sin, but empathize. Empathize is different than sympathize. If I sympathize with you, I feel sorry for you. If I empathize with you, I genuinely feel the pain of your life. Are you getting this? And so kindness is the ability to adapt to whoever you're talking to and wherever God has sent you. And to adapt. And then the goodness, and I got a round third here. The goodness is God's goodness represents everything. Somebody say everything. (coughs) Excuse me. That God is. Everything that God has and everything that God desires for us to experience. When When I think of the word goodness, my mind goes back to when I was a kid. And uh, I grew up in a wonderful Assembly of God church, cut my teeth literally on the back of a wooden pew. I was in church from the week after I was born. I was there. And uh, I grew up there. And they used to sing this song. They, they, they had no idea. But, but see, I didn't, my parents didn't allow me. We didn't have, quote, kids ministry. And so I had to sit next to my parents in big church because there was no little church, as in it's little, right? I, I, anyway, so, by the way, we don't have Holy Spirit, big Holy Spirit and little Holy Spirit, right? Holy Spirit's going to change your children's lives right now as we speak. There are often times that the move of God in our kids' ministry surpasses what we're experiencing at home. Hallelujah. Glory to God. So, I, I digress. Um, so, so, when I was a kid, we used to sing these songs. And I would sit in church because my parents were staunch. I couldn't bring a coloring book like my friends did. Well, you can read the Bible. Well, all we had was King James. Back in those days, there weren't all these translations out there. If you read from another translation, you could lose the time. Heresy, right? And on and on. And so I only had a Bible or a songbook. So I would open up the songbook and I would read the lyrics as a preschooler I'm, I'm, or early elementary. I'm reading the lyrics and I'm trying to make it out. And they would say, Turn to page 236 when we all get to heaven, right? And you would turn that, and they would say, "We're going to read. We're going to we're going to sing the first and third stanza." I didn't know what a stanza was, but you know, I found out later that's the verse, right? And so, so they would go through all that, but they would also sing choruses, and they used to sing this chorus, and it was from Psalms 23, but I didn't know that. And it was this, it, it went sort of like this, forgive me, I'm not trying to run you out, but it was, surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the day. All the day, right? So, surely goodness and mercy will follow me 
I was looking around the congregation trying to figure out who Shirley Goodness was. I was. And Mercy. Who's Mercy? Shirley Goodness. I, d- I don't know her. And I was thinking, they're going to follow me. Whoever they are, they're following me everywhere I go. Into the house of the Lord. I knew I was in church, so surely and goodness, or surely goodness, had to be somebody in the church. Hallelujah. And mercy, too. Who's mercy? Right? And so, I'm learning these songs, but I had no idea until later when I read David said in Psalms 23 at the end, he says this, truly, not, not just when I got out of the King James, right? Who says that? Surely. Raise your hand. <laughs> truly, I'm telling you, and in the translation it says, goodness and kindness. His loving kindness will pursue me all the days of my life. And it became reality to me that the goodness of God and the kindness of God, these two attributes, are the pursuit of us. And then I read over in the book, do you, do you understand this? This is the picture of God reaching us. And then I read over, it means this, the Greek word that means being good to someone. Being good to someone. It it also means going beyond yourself for a need. Going beyond yourself for the need of somebody else. Listen to this in the Passion Translation. It reminds me of the book of Ephesians. I, w- I want to read this out of the Passion. Just, just get a hold of this for a minute. I was looking at this earlier this morning. Even though you were once like corpses. I love Ephesians chapter 2 because it tells us our status. It tells us where we were when God came looking for us to find us in our misery and in our pain. Even though you were once like corpses, dead in your sins and offenses, it wasn't that long ago. Remember where you were when he came looking for you. See, so many times we come to Christ and we walk away from and and we have very short memories of where we came from. I will never forget where I came from. I will never forget where I was, that messed up kid that Jesus came and found. Come on, somebody. Because the moment you forget that, you lose touch with everybody else who's lost around you. You lose touch with them. And that's the problem with the religious in this city as well as the world today. May we never become like that. He said, remember where you were. You were dead in your sins and offenses. It wasn't that long ago that you lived in the religion and the customs and the values of this world. Obeying the dark ruler of the earthly realm who fills the atmosphere with his authority and works diligently in the hearts of those that are disobedient to the truth of God. The corruption that was in us from birth. He said, you were born into the sin nature. The corruption that was in us from birth was expressed through the deeds and the desires of our self-centered lives. We live by whatever natural cravings and thoughts our minds dictated. Living as rebellious children, subject to God's wrath, like everybody else. He said, don't act like you're all that and a bag of chips. You were there too. And he said, I'm calling you in the body of Christ. Remember where you were. And then he says these beautiful words. But God, 
but God. I was a hopeless mess, but God, but God, who loved us, loved is an action word. He said he loved us with such a great love. He is so, I love this, rich in compassion and mercy. Even when we were dead and doomed in our many sins, he united us into the very life of Christ and saved us by his wonderful grace. He raised us up with Christ and the exalted one. And we ascended with him, with him, into the glorious perfection and authority of the heavenly realm. For we are now, he said, you were there, but because he pursued you, you are now seated together as one with Christ. Throughout, And he says, here's why. So that throughout the coming ages, we will be the visible display of the infinite riches of his grace and kindness, which was showered upon us through Christ Jesus. And it says Christ Jesus for this reason. Have you ever wondered in the scripture when it says Jesus Christ and in other places it says Christ Jesus? It is the word theologically for the hypostatic union of God and man. When it is Jesus Christ, it is man trying to get to God. And when it is Christ Jesus, it is God trying to get himself to man. And he said, we got saved because of Christ Jesus. Oh, glory to God. We are now seated together in heavenly places because of Christ Jesus. He came. He pursued us. He came after us. And now we are there. And may we never forget from where we've come from. And remember, it was all about him. It means to go beyond yourself and to sacrifice for a need, to meet another's needs. Somebody who is generous, big-hearted, charitable, their goodness. It is the Greek word that connects us to a philanthropist who is going out and supporting charitable works and helping the poor and needy. The picture is this. God is so filthy rich. But he didn't hoard that to himself. He came and bestowed upon us to share in his wealth. And he said, that's the goodness of God. He said, it's the goodness of God that draws us to repentance. Do you get this? So I end with this verse. Acts chapter 10, verses 34 and 30 through 38. The setting is this. Peter is in the house of Cornelius, who is a Gentile. Peter, a Jew. The Jews and the Gentiles have no interaction whatsoever. God speaks to Peter and he says, don't call unclean what I have cleansed. And he shows him an open vision on the rooftop. And suddenly there's a knock at the door. And these men are saying, we're looking for a guy named Peter. He said, that's me. And he said, our leader, Cornelius, has requested that you come. Because God, watch this, who was speaking to Peter, was speaking to Cornelius, a Gentile over here, and saying, send them to this house, and I'm going to have a man come to you and share with you what you need to hear. So Peter gets off the roof. He goes to Cornelius' home. This is, watch this, the first time in Scripture that Gentiles are brought into the kingdom. And when he is standing in front of Cornelius, Cornelius asks him, what are you here for? What is it you're supposed to tell me? 
And Peter replied, I see very clearly that God shows no favoritism. In every nation, he accepts those that fear him and do what is right. This is the message of good news for the people of Israel, that there is peace with God through Jesus Christ. Man trying to get to God through Jesus Christ, who is Lord of all. You know what happened throughout Judea. I love this. Beginning in Galilee, after John began preaching this message of baptism, and you know that God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Spirit and with power. Then Jesus went around, look at this, doing good. The goodness of God. It is goodness and kindness are the expression of the character and the nature of God to hurting people. This is why we need to walk in the Spirit and have the goodness of God and the kindness of God. Jesus himself went about doing good, or in the Greek it means a a (laughs) do-gooder. I love it. The Message Bible, listen to this. Peter almost exploded with his good news. It is God's own truth. Nothing could be plainer. God plays no favorites. It makes no difference who you are or where you're from. If you want God and are ready to do as he says, the door is open to you. The message he sent to the children of Israel was that through Jesus Christ, Everything is being put back together again. Well, he's doing it everywhere with everyone. Do you get this? Do you understand that if we walk in this fruit of the Spirit, we're able to reach hurting people everywhere we go? What if? What if I walk in the Spirit? What if? about the teacher that's down the hall from the new teachers. Quit complaining about the way everything is. You are there. You were planted. You were put there not to make a living. Making a living is the byproduct of being there. the poor and the needy, but go in the Spirit. Go and help those that are lost. He says, the only way you're really going to do this and set aside your own selfish ambitions and your own self-centered life is to walk in the Spirit. Because one of the attributes of the flesh is self-centeredness. And if you're that, listen to me. Going in, I just I don't know why I'm drilling down on this. But some of you teachers, you're going to be going back to school and back to the classroom, back to the campus here in a month or so. We need to shift and begin to understand that I am not just going in to make a living and there's another school. I am sent by God. I am planted of the Lord. God put me next to that teacher that is an atheist or an agnostic. God put me here next to that person that is so liberal in their mindset and they want no part of God. God put me here to be fruitful, to be fruitful, and to display 
the goodness and the kindness of God so that I can look at them and say, your life is a mess. Tasted of his goodness. That's how you know they're his. Because right where they are, you don't judge them, you adapt, you love them, and you just tell them this is what God has for you. Look at my life. It's an example. See, I see there's no greater word that you have that overcame by the blood of the Lamb than the word of the woman at the well did not go in giving all the theology and Romans wrote it and where all of a sudden there was a new Lord and the Savior and all this and that. All she did was say, I've been looking for love in all the wrong places. I'm just like you. I'm just like you. Just like you. You all know me. I've had five husbands. I've had mar- failed marriages. And now I'm shacking up because I've done give up on love. I've done give up on marriage. Won the whole city. The disciples who went without Jesus went into the same city, smelling the aroma of him. He smelled the aroma of him. He said, I'm still going to get you. But now I'm going to wash your feet. She identifies with him. She said, is to win the loss at any cost. No compromise. Not compromising who we are. 